Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Okay, so come on, let's go before the Lord and study the Word. Anybody ready for the Word? All right, stand to your feet and let's go before God. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, glory, and all the honor. We just thank you, Lord, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts, our lives this day. We haven't come into this house, Lord, to hear from a man or a woman. We haven't come to be distracted by a bird, (laughs) unless it's the dove that flies from heaven and lands on all of us. But Lord, we just thank you that we have come into this place to hear from the teacher of the church, which is the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, all the glory, all the honor. Thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts and our lives. Bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We just thank you, Father. We just give you the praise, give you the glory, give you the honor. Bless our Baptist brothers, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary chapels in Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis, Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, Four Square Denomination, our Adventist brothers and sisters, Catholic brothers and sisters. We love you, Lord. We thank you, God, for... Emmanuel Baptist and Trinity and Ecclesia Church in the way. God, we just thank you for the great things you're doing. Bless all the churches as you would bless us this day. And we'll give you the praise, glory, and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name with a great big shout, we all say amen. amen. We've been talking about on Sundays, for those of you that aren't here, out of the fourth chapter of Hebrews about how the children of Israel didn't make it in in this, that particular generation into the promised land. They didn't believe God. They didn't mix the word of God that they heard with faith. They never got to where they needed to be and never got to where they wanted to be. I'd said it over and over again to all of us that are in here that God has your personal promised land and your home, family, future, finances, dreams, vision. Whatever it might be, God wants to take you to a personal promised land. In order for that to happen, you're going to have to be what God would have you to be. And we were talking about how Christians fail, if you remember, some of the things that Christian, Christians do that causes them to fail in their life and in their family. We ended up with this one that says we live carnal lifestyles. And that was a really important thing. I've just been thinking about it. I haven't been able to get it off my heart when God gave me um, the assignment to bring forth the next couple of weeks for you on Wednesday nights about this wonderful subject. And it's a subject uh, that I might mention to you. It's about carnality. And uh, in this word, carnality is a fabulous word, and it really means so much to all of us. And it's really controlling the carnal mind is the title of the message. And this is part number one. Let me explain to you what that means. The word carnal means fleshly. The word carnal means that you are somebody who's getting your directions. Listen to this. Getting your assignments, getting your inspiration, getting your feelings, all from your emotions and your thinking and your feelings. Everything that you desire, everything you want, every place you're going to go, everything you're ever going to do, you're going to do because you're moved by the flesh to do it. And when you become a carnal person, a fleshly person, who guides their life by the flesh, listen to what I'm going to say to you. You will never, 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 never please God. I don't care if your life is completely successful economically. I don't care if you're the most popular person on the planet and people give you all kinds of awards and have ceremonies about you and celebrate you. You will never be pleasing to God. I don't care if you make a billion dollars and give it away. You will never be pleasing to God. You were never designed to make decisions and go places and make uh, passions and go to your directions and gather information from your 
soulish realm from that realm of the flesh. And when you get directions and you get your inspiration for desires from the flesh, then you will never be happy, you will never be fulfilled, and you will never please God. The problem with all of that I just said is that we all do it. We all make decisions based on our desires and our wants. What we think in our flesh, it's called carnality. And it means that you and I are both fleshly thinkers. And somehow we need to renew our fleshly thinking to a spiritual thinking person. Are you following me? And we're all there. I don't care who you are. I don't care how spiritual you think you are, how many times you can quote scriptures. If you are making decisions, getting directions, uh, having inspirations for life's future from your flesh, you're a carnal person. We all do it. Now, the problem with it is, as I said, you'll never please God. You'll never be fulfilled. Why do we all do it? How did this happen that all of us are born making decisions, getting directions in life from what we think instead of what God says? You'll find in Genesis, the second chapter, I think it's verse number 17, where God warns Adam and Eve, and he makes a statement to them He says, you can partake of all the trees of the knowledge of all the trees in the garden, but do not partake of this particular tree, the tree of knowledge of good and of evil. When you do, you'll die. They came along and they partook of that tree. And all of a sudden, instead of them drawing their direction, getting their inspiration, getting the formula and acting out life according to what God would have, Now they decide for themselves what is good, what is bad, what life should be like, what it isn't like. Uh, You know, they decide now for themselves, and they became carnal-minded. That carnality of the mind is passed through the generations. We're just born in this physical body, and therefore it's something very difficult to overcome. We all work on it all the time. When we partook of the tree of knowledge of good and of evil... We didn't physically die, but we died spiritually because now instead of us being spiritually connected to God, getting our directions and inspirations and our desires fulfilled and our wants fulfilled by him, we get it done by our own calculations and thinking. We live carnal lives. Problem with that is, again, is that you and I, I'm going to say it again for about fourth time because I want you to get it, is you'll never please God and you'll never be fulfilled. It has to change. And God gives us the great ability to change. With the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells on the inside of us, we don't have to draw directions in life from the flesh. We don't have to get our insights from the flesh. We don't have to get our passions and desires based on what we feel and our senses. We can get it from God when we do We now become pleasing to God and we become a people who live in the life of God instead of the life the world has to offer, which is no life at all. Does anybody follow me? This happens all the time and it was the exact problem with the children of Israel as they were in the wilderness wanting to go into their promised land. They were making decisions on how to get to the promised land based on their own insight, on their own directions and what they felt, what they thought, what they think, what they had learned, what they had calculated. And that for, therefore kept them out of the promised land. I love what Pastor Deborah said. Pro, Pastor Deborah said they were brought out of bondage, a land of not enough, into the wilderness, a land of just enough, and they needed to go to the land of more than enough, the promised land. And you and I are brought out of bondage, the land of not enough, into an area where we're developed by God, the wilderness, a land of just enough. And a lot of people just stay there because they never get rid of their carnal mind and thinking, and they never get into the land of more than enough. And so in order for us to get to where we need to be, we need to be a people that are wise enough, number one, to realize we have a problem. And the problem is we want to think on a carnal level instead of a spiritual level. 
And how can I control my carnal mind in such a way that it's, it's stopped, it's hindered, and it doesn't control me so that I can be the blessing that God would have? This is part number one. I want to take you, if I may, to Numbers in the 11th chapter. Let's go there together. In Numbers, the 11th chapter, it's a powerful chapter if you ever get some time to read it. And Moses' relationship with God. In verse number one, you'll find that the people were complaining and it was displeasing to God. So God put a fire around them. I mean, I want you to know something. When people complain after God has blessed them, it becomes incredibly displeasing to God. It's just a little warning for all of us. Because sometimes, I was sharing with the staff today, sometimes we forget where we came from and forget about what God has done and how much God has met us. For The victories of the past are very important for us to keep inside of our hearts all the time. Here they are. God has brought them out of that land of, of not enough, that, if you will, Egyptian bondage, right? And he's done it with miracles and signs and wonders. And he brings them to a place that is absolutely in awe. And after a while, here they are complaining. And when you complain about something today because you forgot about what God did yesterday, you're making God upset. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to make God upset. But in verse number four, it says this, says, now the mixed multitudes. Now, when you see the word mixed multitudes, you'll see it from time to time. Inside of the, inside of the Israel uh, uh, people, there were people that were Canaanites and people that were Egyptians that were married to Israelites. And they were called the mixed multitude. And so they were following wherever the Israelites went, but they were from a different tribe. And they had married and they were now implanted within them, and it's called the mixed multitude. So don't let that be confusing to you. Now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense cravings. When you yield to intense cravings, it's a very common Thing. We got expressions like, man, I'm so hungry I could eat a cow. Has anybody ever heard that before? Man, I, I don't care what it is. I, I'll eat anything right now. I'm starving. I'm so tired I could sleep anywhere. Well, I mean, we are constantly, if you will, uh, in, in, in an area of being yielded to intense cravings. And that's where we come along. That's carnality. In other words, something, there's a passion on the inside of us that's moving us somewhere instead of God moving us. So here they are. They, they yielded to intense cravings. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, who will give us meat to eat? Now, I want you to know they've been getting manna from heaven. That's God's angel food on a regular basis. They learned how to put it together, learned how to make bread out of it. They learned how to do a lot of things with it, grind it up, do everything with it. It was really cool. And every day it would drop out of heaven, except on the Sabbath, it'd drop out enough for two days so they didn't have to pick it up on the Sabbath. And so here we find it's really fascinating uh, uh, complaining going on. Who's going to feed us meat? We remember the fish in which we freely ate, verse number five, in Egypt. The cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the, and the onions and the garlic. Isn't it interesting how we remember and all of us about the fleshly things of the past, but we don't remember the spiritual things. And for all of us, that's a trap because we want to remember the fleshly things. I, I remember when I did this. I remember when I did that. I remember when I, But stop, wait a minute. Do you remember when God did something on your behalf? And so the tendency is always to be somebody who's going to come along and remember what we, because it's all about us. And when it's all about us instead of about him, we've missed it. We're carnal minded. Yes, is anybody listening? Yes. And they remember all of these things as if they like had abundance. They don't remember building the uh, bricks without any straw. They don't remember working and being beaten by everybody that wanted to come along and beat them. They don't remember about them miserably. And they don't remember about never being free. Remember about all those. They just remember this stuff. And, and it's not just picking on them. We're exactly the same. And verse number Let's take a look at it, if you will. Uh, go with me in verse number six. But now the whole being is dried up. They said there's nothing uh, all, at all except this manna before our eyes. Man, they loved it when it first fell. See? And they got carnal-minded. And again, just real quick, take a look at Psalm 78 with me. 
in Psalm 78. We're talking about clearing up and controlling the carnal-minded thinking. And first, we've got to understand that for all of us, oftentimes it's really a problem for us. In verse number 18, it says, And they tested God in their hearts by asking for the food of their fancy. Verse 19, yes, they spoke against God. They said, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? In other words, they were challenging God. And their carnal mindedness really got them out of the place where they put a test to God. I'm here, can God meet me where I'm at? God's pretty fed up with about the whole thing, you know. Jesus talks about something really similar in John the 6th chapter. Go there with me. Matthew, Mark, John, come on. In 6th chapter of John, it says these words. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, listen to this. Jesus answered them speaking to his disciples and the people around him. He said, most assuredly I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but you, listen to this, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Now stop right there. Let's just think about this just for a moment. You seek me not because of the spiritual stuff. You seek me to see what you can get. And I wonder how many of us would be seeking God if we got nothing from God, just sought after him because he was God. When you finally get to the place in your walk where you say, God, it's not about me, and it's not about giving me something, it's not about me having something, it's all about you, God. What I really want in life is I really want you. I don't want anything else, I really want you. And what I'm not going to lose is I'm not losing you. I'm telling you, you just took a step forward. And Jesus has put the test to these people because they're carnal minded and they're saying, listen, you're following me because you can get something from me. I don't want to be that way, neither do you. I remember when I was a young preacher, I was complaining to God about the size of the church. And I finally got to the place, I said, God, I can't make this church grow. I, I just, you know, I just can't do anything about it. But there's one thing I want, God. I've been praying and asking you to fill the church up and bring the people. And I, I, I want that, but I don't care anymore. What I want is you. Whether people come or don't come, I'm not losing my relationship with you because of the people. I'll never forget the church started growing immediately right after that. Sometimes we got to get to the place where we're really saying to ourselves, why are we after God? We going after God because we're he's God? Or are we going after God because we need something? If it's because you need something or want something, or God can do something for you, can I tell you something? Go buy a dog. It's a whole lot cheaper and a whole lot better. Because you're going to get nothing out of it, God, if you will, if you're just after him to get something. He'll give you anything you want to get, but he's got to be first, and you've got to seek him because he's God. And wouldn't it be great to have a church that just sought after God because he's God, not because they can get something from God, like he's some big slot machine in the sky. You know what I'm saying? He says, you, you, he, he, listen, you, you seek me not because you saw the signs. Carnal-minded, you seek me because I fed you. You're here because you got fed. Whew. It's a real challenge to us spiritually. Verse 27, do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you because God and the Father has set his seal upon him. In other words, man, don't go for the stuff of this world that's going to pass away. Go for God. All the stuff. What does it say? John, uh, uh, in uh, Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. Then all these things will be added on to you, but first God. First, got to be God. Then the stuff comes later on. It's not give me the stuff and then I'll serve you God. I'll serve you God whether I get the stuff or not. And then God will add the stuff. It is in listen. If you don't do it in that order, then you're carnal minded. And I know you don't want to be carnal minded because that's not pleasing to the Lord. Paul writes about something. There's a time uh, in Paul's life where his flesh just kind of overrules everything. Some of the worst teaching in Christian churches today 
is found in Romans, the seventh chapter, where Paul writes, man, inside of me there's, there's this, this war going on. I want to, but I can't. And the, my spirit wants to, but my flesh doesn't. And it's like everybody, the worst teaching is, is you le are left there thinking that if Paul couldn't overcome the flesh, then you'll never overcome the flesh. Worst teaching in American churches today. But let's read it for ourselves, the seventh chapter of Romans. We're talking about the flesh, and Paul is in a battle here, and he describes what it's like, and it's really quite fascinating. In verse number 22, for I delight, seventh chapter of Romans, verse number 22, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. You ought to circle the words law of God according to the inward man. There's something on the inside of him that says, wow, I really love this the law of God, the things of God, the ways of God. The word law there is a, another word you could write next to it. It's called the practice. I really love the practice of God according to the inward man. There's something on the inside of me that loves this practice. Then verse number 23 comes up. But I see another law, circle the word law, in my members. Now there's a law of God and there's a law in the members. Second law he's talking about. There's a different practice that's going on. There's a practice on the inner man that loves the ways of God. There's a practice also inside my members. Talking about his flesh. Watch this. Then he comes along and says, warring against the law of my mind. There's the third law. Now there's also the, the a law that's of his members, and now that's which is his flesh, and now there's a law of his mind that's taking place. So there's the law of God or the practice of God, there's the practice of the flesh, and now there's a practice of the mind that he's talking about. And then he comes along and he says this and brings me into captivity to the law of sin. Now there's a fourth law that he describes in one verse. The law of sin. So there's a law of God, and I love it by the inward man, but then there's also the law of my flesh, something that happens on the inside of me. It's a desire that I have on the inside of me that keeps me from that law of God. And then there's a law of my mind that gets along with the law of the flesh, and all of a sudden the law of the mind keeps on going, and all of a sudden I really love the law of God, but I've got the flesh and I've got the mind working against me. And now he comes along and he says, and it all takes me to the law of sin. And remember, when you're operating in sin, you end up in what? Death. And he makes this statement, and he says these words in verse number 24, O wicked man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of death? A lot of people just stop right there and say, see, Paul couldn't work out his fleshly problems. What makes you think you can work yours out? Keep reading, dummy. <laughs> I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I thank God through who will deliver me. I thank God through Jesus Christ uh, our Lord. <laughs> In other words, there's hope for all of us carnal-minded people. <laughs> Gosh. And he comes along and he does us great things. He says... Um, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So here's the law of God and the mind working together. And then here's the flesh working with the law of sin. It brings them to death. Both of them split right down the middle. A lot of times we don't see the truth of all of this. And God set us free. I don't know if you remember some years back, and I'm not anybody's judge. There was this old guy on television. He was a really uh, thought of himself as a brilliant Bible teacher. Always had a white board or blackboard. Wrote out all the, don't give me any names, just shut up. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and he wrote out all the, you know, the Greek and the Hebrew and pronounced it and looked like he was real smart and then he was really into this grace thing where he'd sit in a hot tub with a bunch of babes with drinking wine, smoking cigars. And, uh, and you probably, if you're around at all, you saw him and said, what is that all about? See, what happens is the flesh is something that wants to rule us. And then we have this grace that comes in that covers the mistakes of the flesh to a certain degree until the flesh ignores the grace. Let me give you an illustration. Listen to this. God set you free 
so the word of God can make you free. Remember how we taught you that? And so as you get the freedom of the word of God on the inside, you're free now to either serve God or serve the flesh, right? And so sometimes we want to serve God and serve the flesh too, and it doesn't work. That's what we're talking about. It's displeasing to God. So we find ourselves looking at some scripture. Let me just pop up Galatians in the fifth chapter in verse number 17 or 13. Let's take a look at it in Galatians, the fifth chapter, verse, verse number 13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty for an opportunity of the flesh. All you had to do is read that one verse to see the guy in the jacuzzi with the scars and the two, two babes with a glass of wine. He's out of, he's out of order. And I don't care how much Greek he knows and how much you know, Hebrew he knows and how he pronounced the names, totally out of order. Why? Because he takes his liberty that God gives him and he uses it for an opportunity of the flesh. So for all of us that are in here, we have to understand that what God is saying to us was we're all carnal minded. We all make decisions based on the tree of knowledge of good and of evil. You have the freedom now to make the choices, which you never had before. So you've been taken out of bondage, and now you're brought into a place where you're moving on to your promised land. And as you're moving on to your promised land, there's where choices are made in order to get your promised land. You cannot live in the carnal mind and be blessed. In fact, let's take a look at it just for a second. Uh, go with me to Romans in the 8th chapter. We'll finish here in just about three minutes or four minutes, uh, hopefully. Romans, the eighth chapter. Let's take a look at Romans, the eighth chapter, started verse number seven. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. See the word enmity there? It's kind of like the word enemy is an enemy to God. And, but it really means more than just an enemy. It really means that... Um, uh, the carnal mind is a natural resistance. In fact, it really refers to both God and carnality naturally resist each other and can't work together. Is what that word means, enmity. Because the carnal mind is enmity, enmity to, to God, a natural resistance against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So the flesh can never be subject to the law of God. If you think you're going to walk in the flesh and walk in the spirit, be successful with God, it's okay. You're wrong. In verse number eight, notice what it says. So then those who are in the flesh cannot I'll finish it. I'll say it. You finish it. For those who are in the flesh cannot be One minute. I'll just try one more time. See if I can hear you. For those who are in the flesh cannot be Can't do it. And that's what we started off to do. And if you're going to be a Christian and go on with God, you're going to have to learn some principles on how to control this flesh. Because this flesh doesn't go away. Have you noticed? Even though Jesus paid the price for me to be free and be free with the Holy Spirit and have the Spirit of God on the inside of me, the flesh doesn't go away. So he gives us all kinds of amazing warnings. Verse number nine comes along. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Most people don't see themselves as being in the Spirit. They see themselves in the flesh, hoping the Spirit will come along and help them somewhere along the line. You've got to see yourself in the Spirit, not in the flesh. In other words, the flesh can't control you, shouldn't have the right to control you, only the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, if he doesn't dwell in you, then tonight give your heart to Jesus and let's get right with God, get filled with the Holy Spirit so that you can get out of the flesh, be pleasing to God, get into your promised land. I'll help you to do that in a few minutes. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his, you're not saved. And some of you maybe ought to look at your life and say, man, I just can't seem to break that power. I, I know who Jesus is. I've not, maybe you need to get right with God and really get the Holy Ghost inside of you. 
Verse number 10 comes along. Let's take a look at verse number 10. For if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. There's something on the inside of you that is the righteousness of God that brings life to your being. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ, speaking of the Father, from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. How? Through his spirit who dwells in you. In other words, there's life waiting for you. Not the life of the flesh, but the life of the spirit. And the life of the spirit is so much more successful because it takes you to your own personal promised land, the land of more than enough. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors. The word debtors is interesting words. means we ought to show that we are obligated. We ought to owe God something. We are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if we live according to the flesh, we will. If we live according to the flesh, we will. If we live according to the flesh, we will. And so we, the church, has got to learn how to live according to the righteousness of God and the Holy Spirit. That dwell, and that's what we do when we gather together. We're learning how to do this. But if we, if the Spirit of God, if the Spirit, you, puts to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, those are the sons of God. For you do not receive the spirit of bondage again, which is the flesh. God didn't get you saved so you could operate by the flesh. He didn't get you free from the flesh. You still got it, but you don't have to be controlled by it any longer so that you could still operate by the flesh. He says you haven't received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption whereby you cry out, Abba, Father. Now all of a sudden, we've got a new family. Yes. And we need to operate in that. Now look, here's the bottom line for today. Number one, because of the fall, because our ancestors and human race were partakers of the tree of knowledge of good and of evil, no longer do they get their directions from God, get their insight from God, get the plan from God, get the desires from God, get their wants from God, get their life from God. They now can make decisions for themselves. You now can decide for yourself what's good and evil. At that moment, we had a breach from God. It's passed along from generation to generation. Jesus comes, pays the price so that that breach with God can be mended and we can now have relationship with the Father again. But we didn't say have relationship based on your flesh, have relationship based on the spirit. And so what we need to see is that we are fleshly people with carnal minds that make decisions in our life based on what we think and what we feel instead of what God says. If we do that, we will never be pleasing and we will end up dying in the wilderness like the children of Israel instead of going into the personal promised land. So we have got to come to a place where we operate in the spirit, not the flesh, so that we can get into the land of more than enough, your personal promised land. And not be carnal-minded, but to be spiritual-minded. When a situation comes your way, you're spiritual-minded. You deal with it according to what the Spirit would have you to do. When something arises in your life that is opposite of what you think, you become now spiritual-minded to direct yourself to do it the way that the Spirit of God would have you to do. This is all things about becoming spiritual-minded. And it's not an easy thing. But it is because the Spirit of God dwells on the inside of you. If you rely on the Spirit of God to show you, then it'll be an easy thing. If you rely on your flesh to expose it to you, it's a difficult thing. So all of us that are in here, we need to operate in the Spirit in order to have the life, not in the flesh that brings the death. Now, 
How do I do that is the question. Next week. I will show you right side, left side. And you're going to, and you need a new, if you hadn't seen it, you need to see it. If you've seen it, you need to hear it again because you forgot it. All those that have forgot what I'm talking about but know what I'm talking about but haven't been doing it, give me a great big amen, would you believe? All right, so then next week we're going to learn how to, I promise you, how, I promise you, I promise you, how to walk in the spirit. Easy, I'll show you how it all works next Wednesday night. If God spoke to you, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. And God, good, I just want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you leave. Could I ask everybody to remain seated? When you get up during this period of time, what happens is it disturbs people around you. And they think about you. They see what you wear, what your hairdo is like, or what you're doing. And what it does is at that very moment, God could have been wanting to speak to them about something. And you disturb them from hearing from God. I don't want to be responsible for someone missing God, not a person. So if I could ask you to remain seated and not get up, I sure would appreciate it. Now let's talk just for a moment. Before you leave this place, you've been great listening to the Word of God. You know, we sang songs, we clapped. You were great hearing the Word. You got something from God, I know you did. Been challenged already on the inside. But tonight, I want to make sure you're all right with God. I want you to check yourself out. The Bible says that you should check yourself from time to time to make sure you're okay with Him. I want to ask you a question. I want you to answer the question in your heart. Nobody will know but you and God. Here's the question. If you were to walk out of this building and your heart stopped and you died, would you go to heaven? Would you go to hell? That's the question. If you died in the next few minutes, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Answer the question and let's talk about your answer. Because your answer says a lot about where you're really at with God. Some of you might have answered and said, well, Pastor Jim, I think that if I died, I'd go to heaven. I, I think I would make it. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can think your way into heaven. You're not going to make it and somebody needs to tell you. I love you enough to tell you the truth. You can't think your way into heaven like whoever is the most positive thinker makes it. You're not going to make it. Some of you might have said to yourself, well, Pastor Jim, I hope that if I died, I, I hope I'd make it. Nowhere in the Bible, again, nowhere. It's not in the Bible that says you can hope your way into heaven. Whoever hopes the most gets to go to heaven, I don't think so. You're not going to make it. And somebody needs to tell you. Some of you might say, well, Pastor Jim, wait a minute. You don't understand. I really love God. I want to go to heaven because I love God, and I, I think I'm going to go because I love him. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible it says because you love God, you get to go to heaven? Nowhere. It's not in the Bible. You say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim, my answer is different than that. My answer is I think I'm going to go to heaven because I'm a really good person. I'm a really nice person. I give my money to charity. I give my money, you know, to uh, my, take care of my neighbors. I'm a good person. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible... Imagine this nowhere. It's not in the Bible. It says you get to go to heaven because you're a good person. Nowhere. It's not in the Bible. You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to tell you. In fact, Jesus says it like this. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. That's what Jesus said. In other words, you can't get to heaven any other way but his way. No other way but his way. Not my way, not some well-meaning church committee's way. Not your way, but Jesus' way. It's the only way you're going to get to heaven. And he tells us exactly how to get to heaven in the scripture. Exactly. John, the third chapter, he says you must be born again. You say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim, hold on just a minute. My mom and dad told me I was a Christian when I was a kid. Took me to catechism class or Sunday school or Sabbath school class when I was a child. 
put a cross, St. Christopher, around my neck. You know, had me christened or baptized when I was a baby. Uh-huh, great. Could you show me that in the Bible? Because it won't get you to heaven. You need to know that, and somebody needs to love you enough to tell you the truth. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor Jim. I, 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 it's got to count for something. Yep, it does. It says your parents were good people, but it won't get you to heaven. Because Jesus said the only way you're going to get to heaven is you must be born again. Now, for a lot of you, those words, born again, turns you right off. The reason it turns you off, because movies and television have portrayed born again people as idiots and radicals and fanatical people, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. Here's what born again means. Let me tell you, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. It always will be, it always has been. God forgive us in American churches, we've watered that down for 250 years. All or nothing, I'll prove it to you. I'll prove it to you. Is that okay, all or nothing? Last book in the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking, he says, I'm coming again. When I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. That's what Jesus said. Do you know what he really said? Here's what he really said by that expression. People that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all. And they're not going to make it. They're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. That's what he just really said. You can call yourself a Christian, but if you're lukewarm, you're not going to make it. And you're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. Let's define for you what lukewarm is. Lukewarm, a little in, a little out. Lukewarm, you know, a little up, a little down. Lukewarm, occasional church attendance, uh, occasional prayer, token prayer. Lukewarm, you're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Lukewarm, here's lukewarm, a little something. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. He's just mixed into all the other stuff you have. He's not everything, he's just something. That's lukewarm, my friend. Somebody needs to love you enough to tell you the truth, you're not going to make it. And tonight... You have a divine appointment with God to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. You've had a lot of appointments in your life. Plumbers and painters and doctors and attorneys. Some you've kept and some you've missed. But tonight you got an appointment with God and you don't want to miss this appointment. God brought you here tonight so you could give him all of your heart and all of your life. It's your call. It's your choice. You can live in that carnal world that will never please God, never get out of anything but bondage, or you can get the Spirit of God on the inside of you when you get born again, and he'll set you free so that you have a, the will and desire and the power to serve God for the rest of your life. And tonight is your night. I already know you know who Jesus is in your head. That doesn't make you a Christian. Even the devil knows who Jesus is in his head. Doesn't make him a Christian. It's not about what you have in your head. You've celebrated Christmas every year. You celebrate Easter every year. You know who Jesus is in your head. But it's not about your head. It's about your heart. And you're going to have to give him all of your heart because he won't steal it from you. He's not a conniver to make you do it. He's not a manipulator to make you do it. He doesn't float around in some cosmic cloud with a two-by-four to hit you in the head. He could have, but he doesn't. He gives you a free will choice. Will you choose to give God all of your heart? Get filled with that spirit that we're talking about so you can serve God and be pleasing to God all the days of your life. Today is your day of salvation. This is your time, a divine appointment with God. You say, Pastor Jim, well, how do I do that? How do I give God all of my heart? How do I give God all of my life? Let's do it God's way, not my way or your way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up. When you hear this sound, bang, your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up, and you can put it right back down. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is I want to give God all my heart. 
give God all my life. I want to be born again, filled with the Spirit of God. I want to go to heaven and deny my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up and you can put it right back down. He said, if you confess me before men, I'm a man, I'll see it. He said, I'll confess you as mine before the Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. The most carnal thing you could do right now is not listen. The most spiritual thing you could do is listen closely and operate. Today, in this safe and friendly place, is your day of salvation. All across this auditorium, I'm going to count to three. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are not sure, again, make sure tonight is your night of salvation. Make sure. Don't walk out of this place hoping you're going to make it. Make sure. All across this auditorium, if you're embarrassed by raising your hand, get over it. Too bad. It's better to be embarrassed in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what God sees. Come on, no one's that dumb. But the devil's trying to talk you out of it right now. I'm counting to three. I've done my job. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you. Back over here. Anybody else? There's seven. Thank you. There's eight. Back in the family room. It's nine. Thank you. God bless you. There's nine. Where are you? Ten. You know, you need to get your hand up. Anybody else? I think I already counted you, but I'll count you guys again. Ten, eleven. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Where are you? Twelve. Where are you? Twelve. Anybody else? In the family room. back here. Anybody else? If you're saying to yourself, I wonder if I should do this, you should. Don't miss this appointment. Make sure. Anybody else? There's 12, 10, 11 wise people already. Anybody else? Anybody else? I'm going to shut it down. You're going to miss this. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? 11 of you? 11 of you? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 11 wise people. Here's what I want to do. From the family rooms, wherever you're at that raised your hands, wherever you are that you raised your hand, you're serious about God. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Check with your neighbor right now. All 11 of you, I want you to get out of your seat. I want you to get in the aisle, bring a friend if you need a friend, get your stuff, and meet me right here in front. Let's have no one leave during this period of time. Let's invite the people to come. All 11 of you that raised your hand, get up here right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, if you raise your hand, you're serious. Come on. You're all I ever needed. Come on, they're coming, give them a hand. Come on, come on, come on, come on. God good. Well, thank God you guys have come. All of you, give me your attention for a moment. This is Pastor Dave right over here. Dave's a really good guy. No strange stuff, no weird stuff goes on. He's going to do three things. Pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. You need to pray to invite him in. Is that okay? Number two, he's going to give you some free stuff about what to do next. Now that you're a Christian, in a few moments, you're going to invite him in. You're going to be a Christian. Now what does God want from you? This is information you can read through. It only takes a few moments. Uh, it's just wonderful, easy. Then three, he's going to do something else. He's going to introduce you to a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. They're friends. We give away friends. That's just how we roll in this church. You need a friend to go on with God. Is that all right? So let us help you so when you come to church, you don't feel like a stranger. You feel like it's your church. You'll, you'll, you'll meet your S. PT, spiritual personal trainer before church, 15, 20 minutes. 
He'll explain the program. They'll go over some scripture, buy you coffee, tea, or nacho. Let them spend some money on you, okay? Comes out of my pocket anyway. So let us, uh, let us uh, spend some money on you. And we just love you a lot. We want to encourage you to help you get strong. Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Dave right over this way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.